Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our in-person three-ring meeting. We have seen this ring, Heritage and Armed Con Conflict. My name is Rhea Stefano, and I am one of the 10 directors at WCG and host for this evening. We have 15 minutes for each talk, and um, we'll have a few minutes for each question, for questions afterwards. Um, we will be recording the talks tonight, and they will be made available on our YouTube channel. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our volunteers that will be summarizing the talks, which will be posted on our website, and that will be announced soon. First up, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Nubi Richardson. Her, her talk is titled Rescuing an Icon, Clara Barton's Civil War Dress. Um, Nubi has been in private practice as textile conservator and museum consultant for over 50, 40 years, specializing in outreach to the small museum community. Her business, Past Crafts Textiles, LLC, focuses on historic clothing and textiles. She is a fellow of the Costume Society of America. She received her BS in costume design from Northwestern University and complete, completed all the course requirements for her MFA in theatrical costume design from George Washington University. While mending garments for high-end high antique clothing dealers through grad school, she switched to textile conservation. She spent two years of intense self-study at the Textile Museum Library, took conservation courses at the University of Rhode Island, University of Delaware, and at the Gerald Ford Conservation Center in Nebraska. She has a parallel career as an appraiser with the American Society of Appraisers, specializing in clothing, textiles, and related materials. Please welcome Nubi Richardson. The American Red Cross received a dress worn by their founder, Clara Barton, from her great-grand-niece. Dating to 1855 to 1863 or 4, it had remained in the family and had been much worn to various commemorations. I should note that the Red Cross is a private facility. However, it maintains a significant costume collection, though it is private and not accredited. Miss Barton is a big deal even today, and you can see some of, the, some of the statistics up here a little bit. Um, basically, she's a historic celebrity. There are 12,500,000 hits on Google. Um, she's just a very big deal, and I had no idea about that. Um, the gift of such an early piece in her career, dating to both before and during the Civil War, um, it was remade in 1860-ish, when she got her start is a significant addition to the collection. I was able to reveal important information about her strategy to bring medical supplies to the front, a task never before done. But I'll talk about some of that later. So I'll give you a sense of the condition. It was a mess. Um, in the bodice, the lining had been shredded at the center front where it had been manipulated. The center back had been cut to release the form-fitting nature of the lining, as later weavers or, or wearers were bigger through the ribcage. Miss Barton always wore corsets which compressed the ribcage. The arm's eye had had all of the cording around it shredded. There was, as you can see here, I hope, um, a long rip through the arm's eye into the bust, which was mended with masking tape. The bodice had been removed from the skirt and inexpertly re-sewn. That stitching was coming undone. The front of the bodice had many losses, as well as holes in the fa fashion fabric. When I examined it, the skirt clearly had all of its original stitching. The deep triple pleats were coming undone, and the fabric at the waist was damaged. There were some significant losses in the body of the skirt as well. Most noticeable was the hemline. The fold line was totally abraded, though the lining itself was intact. The skirt had been turned up three and a half inches and badly hemmed at a later date. And you can also see here um, holes in the brocade. The hem revealed the original wool binding used to hem dresses in the period. The wool braid showed evidence of considerable losses, probably due to moths. 
For treatment, I started by vacuuming and found a few old insect frass, but not much. I placed the dress in a passive hydration chamber as it was a bit crispy. Overall, though, the dress was structurally pretty strong, and despite losses, the fabric, the silk, was strong and flexible. No rot, no shattering. It spoke to the quality of the silk. Well, with all those holes, I had to find fixes for the holes. As the dress was to be mounted and put on public display for a long time, my job was to stabilize it and in so doing, improve its appearance. Audiences forgive damaged artifacts, provided they look cared for. Remember that. That's one of our jobs as conservators. I found fabric for underlays in a large facing on either side of the bodice front and almost 12 inches turned up under at the waist. From, they hemmed from the waist up. They didn't hem from the bottom in those days. So a 12 inch turnaround uh, gave me a lot of fabric and that was just plain luck. Tools of the trade, as most of you probably already know, my needles were a size 14, which is pretty thin. I used etymology pins, made sure there was no glue on them when you ordered them. Uh, number 80, and 80 heirloom sewing, sewing thread, and hair silk, also sewing thread, which I dyed by pulling each strand individually through a dye, a, a dye pen, acid-free, so it would give me exactly the color I needed. And I custom dyed nylon monofilament bobbinet from Dukeries Textiles in Nottingham, England. It's knitted, not heat set, and it has a lot of flexibility and bias, which gives what you need for 3D artifacts such as costume. I also used wax paper. The wax paper uh, gave me the pattern of the fabric design around the loss. I etched it with a needle. And that was my template for cutting out the patches. Didn't do any harm to the garment. For the losses in the silk, I darned over a very lightweight piece of cotton, then covered the area with the nylon bobbinet to consolidate the fraying silk. This was a brocade with floating whiffs. For the bodice lining, I found similar lining from an 1840s dress and pieced in the patches as you can see here, I keep distressed historic garments in order to cannibalize them. Come on, you. There we go. The net also helped consolidate the losses. I realigned and restitched all the pleats, which was a major big deal because there are three on each side. The skirt weighed a ton. The skirt losses were stabilized by carefully aligning the design so that the underlay matched the brocade. There was a lot of futzing, a technical term. Again, covering the areas with dyed bobbinet helped blend in the visuals of the losses. You know, it took me a minute to figure out the cause of the losses along that three and a half inch band where the skirt had been folded up originally, or at least when I got it. I puzzled over it and then I put it on a form. I have mannequins. And suddenly it all became clear. That skirt was 180 inches around, big even for the period, and was to be worn with a 120 inch circular hoop skirt. Miss Barton wrote on her, uh, in her letters about her insistence of always wearing the largest hoops. She was only about five foot tall. And without that hoop, the skirt dragged the ground. Obviously, hoops take up a lot of room. Well, her forebears didn't get that as they were um, wearing it to great celebrations of her life. Um, so the skirt was hemmed up because it was, quote, too long, unquote. From a viewer's distance of two to three feet, however, the dyed net hid the damage pretty well. 
I used the book muslin lining of the skirt as a support, and it really did work well. The wool hem braid was really chewed up. But what I did was I unpicked it completely, and I slid it lengthwise. And I took what had been on the back and consolidated it with the losses on the front to create a visual whole. Now remember, this is a private museum. I could do this. And then I covered it with the conservation net and pulled that to the back, creating a hem facing. Um, the, join, the join worked beautifully, and nobody could tell the difference. I built a form using, using um, Manex France display. I'm going to talk about this very, very briefly, which is Adi tested, in case anybody has any questions about that. Carved the form patted her out, built arms and stockinette. And fortunately, my friend Dr. Karen Bolicki at Chippensburg University's Fashion Archives had a hoop of 120 inch of round that she'd made for herself. She teaches historic dancing. It was too unwieldy to wear. So she sold it to the project. Again, luck. So, Ms. Barton is at home to visitors. You can go see her at the American Red Cross. We had to order a four foot by four foot by, I guess it's six foot tall or eight foot tall case for her. I have finally gotten them not to put it on display full time, but she's on display much too much. As a postscript, I'm a costume historian and by sleuthing at the seams, I was able to piece together the story of the dress. The silk was very, very expensive in its day and it was imported, no doubt. It's either French or English, I'm not sure which. It dates to the mid-1850s. There were not too many stylistic differences, both in fabrics and in dress style, from the mid-50s to the early 1860s, which is why intact 1850s dresses are actually pretty rare, because they were remodeled during the war. Originally, this was a reception gown with a different sleeve style, judged on what had happened at the arm's eye probably a bishop's sleeve, which was short and had an undersleeve. The sleeves were replaced, and the bodice had had a basque waist, which is pointed in the front. It had been cut. The dress was restyled in a very conservative, fan-fronted style, with one-piece sleeves. Miss Barton was well employed at the time at the U.S. Patent Office in the mid-1850s. A new administration came in and fired all the women. And she fell on hard times. But she could have afforded this silk at the time. When she returned to the Patent Office, there was a change of administration, which hired back the women. Then the war broke out. She saw the need to get supplies to the front lines, not miles away right up front. This idea was revolutionary. She had to lobby the generals. Well, women at the front lines were considered camp followers. She was no better than she should have been, as they say. I think she used her personal appearance to get her foot in the door. Women involved in, in the war were just a non-starter with them. No respectable woman would go anywhere near the battlefields, nor would a gentleman expect them to especially conservative general. But in wearing that dress, she looked like one of their wives. Well heeled, dressed in expensive silk, they had to pause before dismissing her pitch because, my God, that could be one of their wives. So this speech, I think, was her elevator speech, her foot in the door, her way of saying, just listen for a minute, and they did. Clara Barton was one smart cookie. All of the research that had been done on her, and trust me, the research is endless. No one had stopped to look at the woman's uncanny ability to get the job done and how she got it done. We know this now because of a single artifact, and that's why a lot of us practice. Thank you.
Thank you. So I think we have time for one question, if there's any. Actually, I have one quick question. What did you use to dye the hair silk? Did you use a pen? I use, I use the acid-free dye pens used by fiber artists. By fiber artists. It's a, it's a felt, basically, a felt tip pen. There's a whole range of them. I got it at Blick. And um, you just drag your hair silk. Interesting. Oh, and it's permanent. I've tested it. It's great. So you get exactly the color you need. Okay, next we have... Sarah Leonowitz, um, who will be talking to about evaluating treatment option, options for war damage manuscripts from the Oriental Institute in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, developing a framework for decision making. Sarah Leonowitz holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Delaware's undergraduate program in art conservation, minoring in art history and religious studies. After graduating in 2020, she worked as an independent contract technician in book and paper conservation for the National Park Service and a private practice in Washington, D.C. She recently graduated with distinction from West Dean's College master's program in the conservation of books and library materials. And she's currently working as a conservation technician at the National Archives and at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Sarah. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Leonowitz. Um, I just received my master's degree in uh, books and library materials conservation from Westine College. And today I will be talking to you about my um, thesis project which looked into the ethics and decision making behind treating war damage objects. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about a manuscript from the Oriental Institute in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina as my case study. So, to give some context, um, the Bosnian War was part of a larger conflict uh, in the former Yugoslavia territory that led to, oh my goodness, um, that led to its uh, disintegration, essentially. Um, and there's a myriad of different causes that have been identified that will vary depending on who you speak to. You'll always get a different answer. Um, but aggression towards Bosnian Muslims is generally agreed to be a result of rising Serbian nationalism. Um, in early 1992, Sarajevo was sieged by Army of Republika Srpska forces, who deliberately targeted museums, libraries, and archives as a form of cultural cleansing. Um, and in the span of just three months, they destroyed over one million manuscripts. The Oriental Institute was one of those institutions. Um, the OI is part of the University of Sarajevo, and they encourage, uh, oh, keep skipping forward. Um, they encourage scholarship of Ottoman Arab culture through the study of um, Bosnian, Arabic, Turkish, Persian, and Hebrew manuscripts. And on May 16, 1992, Republic of Srpska forces fired phosphorus shells at the Institute. And their collections, which were housed in metal containers on the third floor of the building, as uh, indicated by that red dot, um, were taken out by the shells and the iron and force beams in the floor collapsed. Um, their collection amounted to nearly a quarter of a million manuscripts before the conflict, and in just one night that was reduced to 105. Um, what does survive is the result of citizens running into the still burning rubble under continuous sniper fire to rescue these objects. And this is one of those manuscripts. Um, Mejmua is an Islamic manuscript or Islamic binding containing the works of 17th and 18th century Bosniak poetry. It's written in Turkish. Um, it's fairly representative of what survives of the collection, both in terms of content and condition. Um, and as you can see, uh, there's just a lot going on here, both structurally and emotionally, which beg the question, how should conservators approach the treatment of war damage? So I came up with a multi-step framework to help reach a decision on how to best reflect the multifaceted stories that are now contained within these types of objects. Uh, so first, you begin with extensive written and photographic documentation like you would in any normal treatment, um, focusing on the materiality and the present condition of the object. And then once you've established what it is you're looking at, you can begin to figure out what's important about it and um, why is it, or what's valued about it. Um, and to do this, I recommend using the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency Value Assessment Framework, and I'll go into why I chose that particular one a little bit later. Um, 
But once that was done, it was really important for me to include um, conversations with experienced conservators who have dealt with these kinds of difficult objects before um, to figure out what lessons and wisdom they could impart to this project in particular. Um, and then lastly, the, the fourth step is to create mock-ups and practice treatments uh, before attempting them on the real thing. This is a pretty common conservation practice already, and I saw no reason why the treatment of war damage objects should be an exception. Um, I would like to make a small disclaimer here that during my time in Sarajevo at the Ghazi Husred Bogova Library, I was just assessing these documents. I wasn't actually treating them. So this is just the results of my assessment. Um, so with Mejmua, um, I recorded information about the binding. I spent quite a bit of time just mapping out its sewing pattern and trying to piece together what its original construction would have been. Um, and then I moved on to documenting what was damaged and what could potentially cause more damage if it were left untreated. Um, probably goes without saying, but this step is crucial in identifying what needs conservation in order to stabilize the object. Um, but documentation also serves as a good reference for when you're constructing your mock-ups and just good general before treatment records. This is the list of damages that I encountered across the objects that I looked at. It was pretty consistent throughout, namely uh, distorted and detached boards, untethered sewing and lost end bands, edge scorching, and extreme embrittlement and friability. Um, Majmua was extremely unstable. It was clearly in need of some sort of intervention or at the very least more protective housing. Um, the OI manuscripts had been stored in just paper envelopes for the last 30 years, which wasn't quite doing as good of a job as it could have done. Um, however, in order to determine which of these maladies to address in my treatment, I needed to figure out what story we wanted to be told once conservation of the object was complete. And to help me do that, I chose to use the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency, or RCE, value assessment framework mainly because of, out of all the ones that I looked at, um, this one was the most user-friendly. It provides you with actual forms, which makes things really easy. Um, and every chapter in the manual uh, gives very detailed instructions on how to follow through with that. Um, it also allows for a lot of different perspectives to be represented in the assessment, um, which is another form that they provide. It's a stakeholder form, and you can identify all the stakeholders from the local and organizational level all the way up to those on a national and international scale. Um, additionally, it um, provides scope for you to reflect the evolving values um, in your objects, which is particularly important for um, war damage material culture. Um, I don't have time to go into like the ins and out of this framework, but if anyone's interested, I did bring my physical copy and we can chat about it later. So these are the results of my value assessment. Um, I'll just focus on the high scoring criteria here. Um, so Mejmua is currently valued in its present condition um, because of how it evokes memories and visions of a particular time and place in history. Um, so that earns at a high score with uh, the historical, social, and perception values. However, it is still an active research object and it was collected for the contents of the binding, so that bolsters its information value quite highly. Um, and with these identified and kind of organized, I was able to uh, begin to map out several treatment pathways that could be appropriate. Um, I won't linger too long here. I know this is, there's a lot going on here, but um, I did want to point out that one of the ways I was able to use the results from my value assessment was to create these charts that kind of pinpoint um, specific treatments or actions that I could take that would honor each of the high scoring uh, values. Now, creating these charts isn't necessary, but I did find it a really helpful visual way to organize my ideas and to help bolster my justifications for possible treatments. So, um, conservation is an incredibly collaborative field. After all, that's why we're all here, to share our experiences. Um, and I felt like incorporating these conversations and interviews into the framework was particularly necessary. Um, I spoke with professionals who are experienced in working on disaster and emergency damage and affected material culture. And I was really keen to figure out what they felt to be the successes and shortcomings of their own conservation campaigns um, so that I could then incorporate those into this project. And with the successful outcomes identified, I could ask myself what treatments would help restore functionality to the object um, as well as the Oriental Institute um, while still maintaining the object's full biography. 
Uh, here's a list of some of the people. Oh, oh dear, I got cut off. Um, yeah, here's a, here's a list of some of the people that I spoke to. Um, some are local to DC and work on these kinds of objects all the time, um, like Jane Klinger at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, while others I chose to speak to because they have a little bit more intimate knowledge of Sarajevo and Bosnia and could therefore provide a little bit more context specific information. Uh, so with a clear treatment path identified, I could move forward with practicing my treatments. Um, when creating my mock-ups, I wanted an idea of how Mejmu's structure would uh, react to the various treatments that I had in mind. Um, however, newer materials are gonna react differently than older ones, um, so I sought out a couple age-appropriate and materially sympathetic samples to use in my simulation, which was to set up a controlled burning. Um, it was really important to practice on actual fire damage manuscripts. But, you, know, you can't just find those, you kinda gotta make your own. Um, so I set up a close recreation of what the OI manuscripts went through. Uh, I placed each of my test object in a metal container and put that over an open flame for about 15 minutes. Um, now the goal of the simulation was not to replicate the exact conditions that the objects went through or the exact conditions of the shelling, but rather to achieve the similar effects that were seen on the OI manuscripts, which I was pretty successful with. Um, this is just the most dramatic example, but across four out of my five test objects, I was able to achieve a lot of the same damages that I listed on that earlier slide, like the board distortions and detaching, uh, edge scorching, and overall embrittlement and friability, uh, which was great because it allowed me to practice a lot of the same treatments that I was looking to recommend to the Gazi conservators and get a fairly accurate idea of what treatments would take well to the actual objects. Um, so, Considering the information that I got from the value assessments and the interviews, I decided to give preference to treatments that would honor the manuscript's um, historical perception, social, and information values, specifically ones that would stabilize the object, like paper repairs, and those that would protect it from further degradation, like custom housing solutions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, practicing treatments allows you to identify what's gonna be successful and kind of get your mistakes out of the way, like my attempt at board flattening here, um, which just resulted in the board snapping. Um, this was a test object, by the way, I just wanna make that extra clear. Um, so this was not a treatment path that I wound up recommending to the, the Gazi. Um, another plus of practicing treatments is that it allows you to compare multiple different conservation approaches side by side. So you could compare and assess a like more interventive approach toward, or next to something that's maybe a little bit more uh, preventive. So while Mejmua did not have this degree of fire damage to the tax block, I still really wanted to practice wet paper mends because I was thinking they might be necessary to repair the spine folds. Um, and I opted for untoned mends since toning your mends kind of seeks to obscure the conservator's interference, whereas leaving them untoned kind of draws attention to them and makes it very plain to the viewer that um, this object underwent treatment in a post-conflict setting. Um, and if the uh, OI manuscripts were treated this way, then the conservators would be able to honor their um, historical value as witnesses to major national and international events, um, as well as restoring uh, access to the informational contents for the researchers in the institution. So in my interview with Jane Klinger, she suggested that I begin to shift my perspective of the um, protective enclosure as you know just a box to you know the actual covering of the object. So I spent quite a bit of time just trying to work out custom housing solutions. Um, which led to the idea of this sort of drawered enclosure that allows the text block to sit away from the covering material and kind of preserve it for as long as possible. So if a researcher were to just want to access the contents within the manuscript, they could just be given that, um, rather than introducing the risk of untrained hands handling the entire fragile object. And one thing that I quite liked about this structure is that it's easily adaptable and it can be made with whatever materials are accessible and be refined as desired or needed. This was another box that I made, which uses foam supports that are molded to the uh, curvature of the damage boards, um, which really just protects it in its current position and in nothing else. Um, 
One thing to note is that it was quite large and very heavy. It also required a lot of um, time, materials, and just general fiddling. Um, so this structure would probably be better suited for a manuscript that the Oriental Institute was looking to put on display or just use as a general showpiece. Um, however, on a personal note, I do feel like this was probably the best solution for this object since now the most interesting thing about it is the story that it tells through its damage um, and more interventive treatments could have possibly taken away from that story. So um, these were the specific treatment recommendations that I made to the Ghazi. First was the stabilization of the text block, mainly through guarding and re-sewing, which restores safe handling and access to the researchers. And then the next recommendation was to create a custom enclosure depending on the OI's intended use for the manuscript now. One that would maintain the association between the text block and the covering materials while preserving them in their current conditions so that their, the object's biography could be uh, reflected and communicated. Now, in order for these recommendations to be effective, or sorry, uh, yeah, to be effective, they needed to be flexible. Um, so while I disclosed what materials I used and what worked well in my exercises, I in no way wanted to mandate that that was what needed to be used. I wanted the Ghazi conservators to feel comfortable using materials that they had access to and were familiar to them, or rather they had easy access to. So in conclusion, I would just like to say um, that when you're dealing with objects that are this highly emotionally charged, you need to create a uh, tailored treatment approach, one that is beyond the remit of codified ethics. Um, and you can do this by critically assessing what is valued and collaborating with the stakeholders. And if you do that, you can create an approach that provides conservators with the confidence in their actions and justifications. Um, and it's my hope that this framework will um, assure conservators, or at least inspire them, um, it, at institutions recovering from conflicts in places like Syria or Ukraine or Israel, um, that they don't need to reinvent the wheel when they're just trying to focus on recovery, but rather they can feel empowered to make the choices that they feel are right for them and their collections in their time of need. Thank you very much. I am sorry for running a few minutes over, but I um, can take a question if anyone's interested. <laughs> No questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you um, for your sensitive approach and, and sharing all the, the factors there. And one of the, I have some experience with the word materials and I really appreciate them so glad you did. I was wondering where you were going with my when I saw the fire test. I was like, okay, yes. It's because there is some stuff that you just cannot experience until you've experienced it. And some of that is the massive amount of scorching and brittle that Go back. just really, I mean, things just fall off. Oh, yeah. Which, in, you know, in a quick recipe situation, you grab what you get. To me, it brings up that notion of what can be a dirty word, acceptable loss. And when that came to my mind, I'm like, there is no more acceptable loss for this. You know, in some places you may you know, you know, you know, or whatever, it's a blank area, you're like, oh, okay. But sure. With everything we know today, it is at times with this new equipment, we through some of the harmonized effects of that fire. To, to hear, hear is more of an emotional connection to, to say that that's what something is more. So I just like to hear you talk a little bit about working with these really fragmentary edges. How can you speak to that or guide? Well, it's probably a little tricky since I didn't actually treat the Oriental Institute manuscripts. Um, but the like the edge scorching, this was a blank page. So I don't know if I really can speak to that because I, I didn't have to actually think about that. Um, you know, these were mock-ups. They were just structural. There was no writing in them. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't know if I really can respond to that. Um, yeah, but it's it's a really interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. 
with enormous incentive if you can. Yeah. And then be an A value of the treatment. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, with my practice yeah. treatments, I was very much of the, the mind that the damage needs to be highlighted. Like, that's, that's the story right there. Um, or it's part of the story. And obscuring your, your treatment doesn't really make sense then, because then you're just obscuring the story. So next, I'll be welcoming Stephanie Hornbeck. She'll be, um, her title is Collaborating to Protect Ukrainian Cultural Heritage, Recent Efforts by the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative Interdisciplinary Team. Stephanie is newly appointed um, is a newly appointed National Preservation Program Officer at the National Archives, and since 2012, she is the consultant to the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, supporting heritage professionals in Haiti, Egypt, and now Ukraine. She recently served as the McCarter Chief Conservator at the Field Museum in Chicago. Prior to this, her private practice, Karyatid Conservation. Um, was based in Miami. Stephanie served as chief conservator for the Smithsonian Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, directing conservation recovery efforts of cultural heritage damage in 2012 with the earthquake. In recognition of her service, she was awarded the Smithsonian Secretary's Gold Medal um, Award for Exceptional Service. From 1998 to 2009, she was object conservator at the National Museum of African Art. Good evening. Tonight I'll present an overview of the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, or SCRI, team's collaborative efforts with Ukrainian cultural heritage partners, and I'll highlight some individual projects. Since August, I serve in a consulting role to SCRI as emergency stabilization conservator supporting heritage stewards in Ukraine. Cultural recovery collaborations have been the most meaningful endeavors of my career, and I have found it very moving and inspiring to learn about the efforts that individual people will undertake to protect and recover cultural heritage in crisis. I thank the Smithsonian Women's Committee for supporting my position. And I want to note that those of us based in the US are not traveling to Ukraine at this time for our work, and our support is provided at distance. In the aftermath of disasters, both natural and man-made, the recovery and protection of tangible and intangible cultural heritage is an important endeavor for people in the safeguarding of cultural identity and history. Cultural recovery is a complex collaborative effort involving local colleagues, culture sector organizations, and conservation specialists, sometimes working internationally. Trusting relationships are critical for effective collaboration in cultural disaster contexts. This work is about people and the bonds we form to each other um, to work together collaboratively. In this work, we external specialists rely on our affected colleagues to determine priorities for recovery efforts. And in building capacities, we directly involve these colleagues in the technical recovery of their own heritage. Since the 2014 Russian invasion of Crimea, and given renewed priority in February 2022 with the expanded to full-scale invasion into Ukraine, SCRI has collaborated with Ukrainian cultural heritage colleagues to safeguard heritage in this crisis context. I'll briefly frame SCRI's work. Following the Smithsonian's Haiti Cultural Recovery Project, where international heritage professionals collaborated with our Haitian colleagues after the 2010 earthquake, then Smithsonian Undersecretary Richard Curran continued to advocate for developing further capacity to coordinate and participate in emergency preparedness and disaster recovery of cultural heritage worldwide. In 2012, Cor Corin Corey Wegener was named cultural heritage preservation officer at the Smithsonian, and she began to assemble an expert team integral to the process of responding to cultural crises from armed conflict or natural disaster. The Haiti Cultural Recovery Project is the origin story behind SCRI. It brought together people who would successfully complete a large scale complex cultural recovery mission in a location with great infrastructure challenges. And it remains the Smithsonian's largest international recovery mission to date. 12 years later, the project principals, Olson Jean Julien, Richard Curran, Corey, and I continue 
our involvement with SCRI. For the Haiti project, Smithsonian conservators participated mainly as training instructors, and a corollary benefit was that Richard and Corey came to know and better understand how conservators could apply specialized knowledge to disaster contexts. After the recovery project ended, Richard, Corey, and I continued to support our Haitian colleagues in transitioning to a more sustainable operation at the purpose-built Kiskeya Conserva Cultural Conservation Center. Olson and I contributed a chapter to the new volume, to this new volume, and in 2021, another earthquake struck Haiti, and the local response effort involved Haitian veterans from our project who were much better prepared from our years of work together. All disaster recovery efforts follow a long arc because dramatic damage involves decades of recovery work, and our decade-long Haiti collaboration offers hard-won insights. Now in its 11th year, SCRI provides a place of leadership, learning, and coordinated response. SCRI engages an interdisciplinary team of staff members and specialist consultants, including conservators in these efforts. And Smithsonian conservators and colleagues, collections colleagues have generously contributed expertise when called upon. SCRI's 2015 Uniting to Save World Culture Symposium included speaker Dr. Ihor Poshivayo, then a fellow at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, and offered an opportunity for SI colleagues to hear about the intersection of community engagement with the crisis underway at the Maidan Museum in Kyiv, Ukraine. At the conference, Poshivaya also learned about the architecture behind the Haiti project and his dialogues with Richard Curran and Corey flourished. And um, he again presented in 2019. In March 2022, Secretary Lani Bunch released the statement safeguarding the cultural heritage of Ukraine, expressing that the Smithsonian stands with the people of Ukraine in their response to the humanitarian and cultural crises underway in this war. And noting Ukraine's long cultural history and seven world heritage sites, Secretary Bunch emphasized SI's core mission to safeguard cultural heritage. And he communicated SCRI's role in partnering with the framework to support Ukrainian colleagues in this mission. This February 2023 program updated Smithsonian staff about SCRI's work. Richard framed the objectives. Corey emphasized the importance of relationships and networks connecting specialists to needs. SCRI disaster coordinator Caitlin Avert discussed activities, and SCRI head of research Catherine Hansen shared updates of monitored sites. The SI community also heard directly from Ukrainian, Ukrainian colleagues um, Ihor and also Bashil Roshko. In Eeyore's remarks, he expressed his commitment to safeguarding Ukrainian heritage as a Ukrainian, a research scholar, a museum director, and a first aider. Eeyore is a respected leader and very effective communicator. His broad efforts to raise awareness about cultural destruction in Ukraine reach beyond professional to general audiences. And in November 2023, for a CBS 60 Minutes program, he interviewed and provided on-the-ground tours of devastated sites. SCRI's current collaborations include supply procurement, partnering to undertake geospatial monitoring with satellite images of heritage sites, and providing virtual conservation consultation, training sessions, and recommendations for recovery. Our partners include the Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, or HERA, in Ukraine, the Cultural Emergency Response, or SUR, in the Netherlands, and the Koshkushko Foundation, based in New York, Washington, and Warsaw. And our work is supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, the Omidyar Foundation, the Bank of America, Mellon Foundation, U.S. Department of State, and the Smithsonian Women's Committee. As needs in Ukraine arise, SCRI has organized multiple consultations with SI conservators, and consultations have involved guidance on safe packing and movement, as well as equipment recommendations. Major collaborators include, include Ukraine's National Research and Restoration Center, 
which supports conservation and preservation efforts throughout Ukraine. Current efforts for these conservators and restorers involve assessments of damage and packing collections for safe evacuation to provisional storage sites. In late 2022, Scry began to partner with the Kosciuszko Foundation, and from its offices in Warsaw, Poland, the foundation works with Scry to assess the needs and methods of response as requested by Ukrainian cultural institutions. And Kosciuszko works with the institutions to purchase cultural heritage first aid and stabilization supplies and organizes transport and delivery in Ukraine. The most sought after equipment includes portable power stations, humidifiers, and dehumidifiers, temperature and humidity sensors and air purifiers, digitization scanning equipment, battery powered lights, and museum storage shelving. The partnership has received more than 50 requests for assistance from Ukrainian cultural organizations, and deliveries have been made to institutions in 13 cities. The Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, HERA, is an initiative of Ukrainian museum experts established in response to Russia's attacks on Ukraine's national and cultural identity, and Ihor is a co-founder. HERA's mission is to promote the preservation of cultural heritage during wartime and its further post-crisis recovery, and their activities include monitoring and documenting damage, and they also have recovery and eventual restoration in mind. HERA is a cultural hub and guides our work by communicating priorities and connecting us to cultural institutions in need. The recent Penn Museum program, Cultural Rights, Heritage, Destruction, and the Future of Ukraine in December, offered an opportunity for Roxolana Makar to present the work of the Ukrainian Heritage Monitoring Lab, or HEMO, and they've conducted dozens of expeditions, surveyed hundreds of sites to record the loss of cultural heritage, document the extent of destruction, and have created a database with information about the sites that they have investigated. And I show here um, two examples that Roxolana presented. And the information in the database will help systematically and comprehensively plan the restoration of monuments, as well as defend Ukraine's interests against Russia in the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Cultural Heritage. Scry partners with the Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, where Hayden Bassett is the director. The lab provides global monitoring capability for cultural heritage sites threatened by armed conflict and natural disaster. It operates through a distributed workforce of archaeologists, art historians, GIS experts, and other heritage practitioners. And among other technologies, the lab uses high-res satellite imagery provided by industry partners to rapidly identify destructive events and active threats to monuments, museums, archives, historic buildings, archaeological sites, and landscapes. And Haydn's team is currently working with Bashil and Roxolana's HEMO team. And together they release periodic reports that look like this. In August, Scry and the U.S. Army Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command convened the Army Monuments Officer Training in Washington. And the course trained an Army Officer Cohort on the military's responsibility in implementing the 1954 Hague Convention for the protection of cultural property in times of armed conflict. The course included three Ukrainian officers, and a special focus of training was Ukrainian cultural property protection. And I was fortunate to attend as an observer, which afforded important context as I was about to start my scry role. And I'm showing you here um, a list of some of the instructors and the topics of their talks. Um, Corey spoke about the, the Hague Convention. Scry's training program manager, Stacey Bow, and Rebecca Kennedy, um, former collections manager at the Postal, Postal Museum and now a consultant to Scry, are experienced trainers and instructors and excellent communicators, and they talked about Communication, um, communication documentation methodology. Ihor 
gave an overview of work in Ukraine, and then Haydn, Brian Daniels, Veshiel, and Roxolana talked about forensic heritage documentation. And the graduation ceremony was officiated by Oksana Markarova, Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States, and Richard Curran. In October, Corey and I collaborated with Getty colleagues Nicole Grabo and Cecilia Winter to virtually teach a two-day UNESCO program on collections care in times of crisis. 32 museum professionals from diverse locations and institutions around Ukraine convened in leave and course participants were selected from more than 400 applicants. Oleksandra Kovalchuk, Deputy Director of the Odessa Fine Art Museum, guided and moderated the course, and sessions were conducted in person and virtually, and simultaneous translation was provided. To prepare, we relied on a needs assessment from Oleksandra based on interviews with 13 museum professionals from diverse institution types and cities throughout Ukraine. And I, I note that they needs, identified needs included strategies and methods to protect collections, a need for information about principles of storage and suboptimal conditions like overcrowding and mold growth, a need for information about selecting and installing climate control equipment, and challenges that colleagues face, which include inadequate human resources, specialized skill limitations in both collections management and conservation, and limited knowledge of how to make practical storage improvements using accessible materials. Corey's sessions involved risk assessment, emergency planning, and emergency packing, and mine involved health and safety, mold and infestation threats, and responses, and the adaptation of collection management solutions to relocation of collections. And I note that the evacuation of collections, both proactively and in response to facility damage, is a significant activity for many cultural institutions. After a missile strike on November 6th damaged the Odessa Fine Arts Museum, Alexandra requested consultation on packing two large oil paintings for evacuation and transport. I reviewed emails and photos to prepare a list of questions for OFAM colleagues and practice, participated in a virtual consultation meeting with painting conservator Amber Kerr, the head of conservation at SAM, Oleksandra, two OFAM colleagues, and Caitlin Avert. Scry intern and Ukrainian colleague Nara Naramanova also joined us. And Amber provided detailed guidance on how to apply protective facings, remove the paintings from stretchers, and roll them safely. And my most recent work involves reviewing and editing sections of a safeguarding manual prepared by Ukrainian colleagues. The report preamble describes the objective to serve as a resource for museum professionals in Ukraine aiming to consolidate a wealth of knowledge on the good practices for the emergency of safeguarding of museum collections. In my review, I also reviewed meeting notes from an August meeting with Corey Wegener and Sam, conservators Leah Bright and Kira Teeter. As I close, I share here links to some relevant press coverage. And also links to read more about our collaborations. And I appreciate this opportunity to share Scry's collaborative efforts with Ukrainian partners. Thank you. I'll have to take any questions if there's time. Yeah. Is there a domestic equivalent? Yeah, Scry also operates domestically. Um, I've been focusing on the internet. My oh, no, my work is international, important. but yeah, they do because focus in. They do have a domestic response effort as well, and they coordinate with um, Lori Foley for that. Um, they they do annual trainings. They're called Heart trainings, and um, Stacy Bow, who's here today, um, can, is the training manager and instructor can. 
tell you more about that, but there's definitely a domestic side of scry as well. Yeah, Jean. Um, I was really happy to see that you did a needs assessment, although you didn't go into any details about that. And I have many, many questions about how, how you approach the needs assessment, who the respondents were. Um, but as part of the re summary of results, uh, there was a point on training. Uh, both for collection managers, registrars, and, and conservatives. So with that, because it's something that um, we've been working on um, as part of an international, actually three different, four different uh, international committees of ICOM, um, with language and translators, and being able to provide, in, in terms of training, being able to provide resources that are in Ukrainian and not expect the Ukrainians to commun always communicate and read in English. Many of them can. Most of the people I deal with are fluent or nearly fluent in English, much more so than I am in Ukrainian by a vast degree. Um, but I'm wondering if there are thoughts about that. And also, um, I'm always one for not working in silos and not reinventing the wheel or repeating projects that have already been done. Um, if uh, you are thinking of making a foray into uh, providing those resources, who are you? collaborating with, uh, are you going to reach out and say, what have you done? This is what we're doing. Um, maybe we combine our efforts. You mean for training or for their needs assessments? Um, providing training and, and materials for training uh, in Ukrainian. Yeah, we were really fortunate, as I said, for our UNESCO organized course that they had simultaneous translation. Um, some of our core collaborators are bilingual. So um, Ihor Pushavayo, Oleksandra, and Oleksandra um, Katerina Kontrova, and Nara um, Narmanova, who's an intern at Scry. So we're really fortunate to have bilingual colleagues assisting us. Um, the Hera folks, um, I, I mentioned that organization and EHOR's work there, they're really guiding, helping guide us in where priorities lie um, and connecting us with their partners as well. So we are looking really carefully to our Ukrainian colleagues to emphasize their priorities their partners and directions we should take. You know, we don't want to impose that on our colleagues, and they, they know best, and we respect that. Um, for our training initiatives, so um, we partnered with the Getty for that course organized by UNESCO, um, but a number of SCRI's colleagues, um, consultants, and experts they draw on are also really well versed um, in ECROM's first aid for collections methodology. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I would say verse, but I'm exposed to it. So we have, um, you know, we certainly have colleagues who specialize in training. Um, but we're we're always open and wel welcome collaborations. This this work is really about effective networks and relationships. So certainly be be glad to talk more or um, have Stacy Corey um, could speak more to in more depth to the resources they rely on Jane yeah <clears throat> yeah thanks for your presentation um, have there ever been cases where um, where other countries have like asked the Smithsonian to um, you know, like temporarily like take possession of their of their art and artifacts for like safekeeping as like part of this overall objective. 
That's a that's a really good question, and I I'm, I'm not in a, I'm not in a position to I'm just not knowledgeable about that. But let me see if Stacy knows the answer to that. My colleague at Scry, um, cause I don't know myself. Um, it's a loaded question. Um, the answer, the easy answer is yes, but not probably how you would think of it. Happy to give you details afterwards. Um, because the Smithsonian, for as long as it's been around, and for these, you know, all of its units and the long-standing relationships that it's had around the world, um, you know, there have been individual cases where you could, um, where you kind of find that. I know, broadly speaking, any of my other Smithsonian staff here who can back me up on this. Broadly speaking, the institution has adopted most recently um, a. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, ethic, uh, shared stewardship policy across the collecting units, and I believe the first one who has actually taken um, the policy and put it into practice uh, is Asian Art, um, where they have um, accepted a collection of Yemeni objects, and they are holding them in trust um, until things stabilize um, in Yemen. Um, that is probably the most recent um, example and one that's done under a broader policy initiative rather than kind of in a very like specific um, anecdotal way, if that answers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I noticed on one slide that you had sites identified for um, later restoration projects. Is that accurate? The, well, the documentation the documentation and assessments that are being undertaken for damaged sites is um, part, one of the future goals is with potential restoration in mind. Um, obviously that's a, a complex question and what would be involved in that is, you know, would require many specialists and partners to, to weigh in on. Um, but um, the care and careful and thorough documentation um, of the damage is being undertaken for multiple goal for multiple goals and one of them is you know potential future um, restoration thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you. Sure.